Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Emily. I'm one of the GIGU Reproductive RFS Service Line Chairs, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. George Slachenko. Um, he did his residency training at Lenox Hill and his um, fellowship training in IR at the University of Colorado, where he's currently one of our great attendings um, and is also the medical director of radiology at the Highlands Ranch Hospital. Today, he'll be presenting some of the basics of prostate artery embolization, or PAE, for the treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Um, so I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Emily. And Emily is one of our great IR residents, so don't want to sell yourself short. All right, so just like Emily said, we're going to be talking a little bit about PAE. Um, there are a lot of slides here. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail. Um, I'll have some time for questions at the end if uh, you have any. So let's get started. Don't have any disclosures. Okay, so BPH. Um, you don't really know what causes it, but um, we kind of figure estimated with the hormones because it obviously is in the prostate, which is um, uh, a gland that is greatly affected and intricately involved with the various hormonal pathways. Um, we do know it's a, a proliferation of, of prosthetic stromal cells. Um, and it's most important thing that I want you to get from this slide and from this lecture is that BPH is not always equivalent to lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs, which is going to be the acronym I'm going to be talking about a lot. BPH doesn't always cause symptoms and uh, urinary tract symptoms aren't always caused by BPH. And we'll kind of go over some different examples of what can cause uh, urinary tract symptoms that aren't from the prostate. Um, and you may see, you know, see in your residency, patients with CT scans with huge prostates and if you want to look in their chart, see if they have any uh, symptoms from it. Some some don't. So um, it's just an interesting um, kind of point that I want to make that you know the size doesn't always correlate to the uh, symptom sym symptomatology. All right, so here's some some patterns um, for uh, BPH. The most important one is, that you should know about is the isolated median lobe. Um, and that's, uh, I guess, A, because uh, you can have both in large median lobe and um, lateral uh, lobes. So the reason I want to mention the uh, isolated median lobe is, is our uh, embolization procedure is not so good at treating the median lobe. Now, there historically, that was a contraindication to treatment because uh, we thought that this could be a ball valve mechanism because if we embolize the prostate, you can imagine the two lateral lobes get necrosed and then the, the median lobe uh, falls off of the necrosed prostate gland and can kind of fall into the prosthetic urethra causing a, a obstruction, uh, kind of like if you look at D there. Um, Cause our, you know, the, the vascular chair doesn't really, uh, uh, feed the, the median lobe too well. But now there's been some more uh, research to show that we can treat certain median lobes. Um, it just can't be isolated. So you want to basically have a good sized prostate gland um, and, and a ratio that's not too overly um, tipped over to the, to the median lobe. You want to have some prostate or some lateral lobe to be able to necrose um, in case you can't get enough necrosis of your, your median lobe, if that makes any sense. So it's kind of a ratio. There's some intricate calculations some people do, but I mainly use it as a, just look at look at the patient. If they have a huge median lobe and that's it's it, I'm probably not going to treat them and we'll refer them back to the urologist. Um, let me go back to that. So BPH versus LUTs, um, as I mentioned before, is an overlap. So um, obviously men over 40 years old will have, uh, the, these two things are affected in, only, in men who are over 40. Um, but not all over men, men over 40 have uh, benign B, uh, histolog BPH or obstruction, which is BPO, and not everybody will have LUTs. Um, so as I said before, this can occur regardless of the prostate size. Um, some uh, symptoms are uh, irritative, like frequency and urgency, obstructive, weak stream, intermittency or hesitancy, or big one. And that's what I see a lot in my clinic uh, patients complain about is nocturia. And that's a really... Uh, helpful symptom when patients do uh, come in and that is their main complaint because you can easily quantify it about how many times they get up and then quantify it after the procedure to see how good your results are. Um, 
this is just a graph showing the incidence of BPH. And, uh, you know, as you get older, uh, incidence approaches 100%. Um, so the older you get, the larger your prostate gets, and the more chance you're going to have of uh, having lower urinary tract symptoms. And the good thing for us is, you know, when these patients are older, they are always great um, surgical candidates. So those are the patients that are going to get referred to us. Um, like I was going to keep mentioning, you know, you want to elicit the etiology of LUTs um, because, again, BPH is not the only cause. There's all these other cause, causes. Um, some of them I never even heard about before I started doing this, like nocturnal nocturnal polyuria. I thought that was something in like kids that boys, you know, grow out of eventually, but I guess uh, older adults can have that. Um, neurogenic bladder is a big one. Um, and it's important to remember that some patients have long-standing obstruction from their BPH can uh, secondarily develop a neurogenic bladder from a weak detrusor muscle after all years of trying to push against an obstructed uh, bladder from the large prostate. So some patients can have both and there's ways to um, kind of work that up. Um, urethral stricture, tumor. Um, so there's many and to choose other activity, those are some other major ones. Um, Parkinson's is neurologic. Um, you know, I have treated somebody with um, Alzheimer's and who didn't have such a great result. And I'm now wondering if this is a, a, a bladder issue, although he did have go see the urologist after and his bladder protrusion muscle works fine. So there's, there's probably a big component of uh, uh, various neurologic syndromes that can affect the bladder that we don't know about. Um, physical exam, obviously it starts with a DRE. I don't do them. <laughs> I'm an interventional radiologist. I leave that up to the uh, primary care doc or the um, urologist who will uh, refer these patients to me. I actually do get uh, patients now referred uh, uh, primarily from their PCPs or uh, just you know patients are very attuned with their health, uh, especially when they can't urinate. Um, so they seek uh, minimally invasive procedures. And now more patients are finding out about this on their own. Um, estimate gland size with DRE. I think it's better done with CT or MR. So we're a radiologist, so we can do a better job than a DRE. Um, important, uh, urophlometry. Um, no, sorry, uh, tongue-tied here. Eurodynamics and post-void residual. So urodynamics is pretty important because that can distinguish between lower urinary tract symptoms from uh, neurogenic bladder or other bladder problems or a, a prostate uh, issue. Um, again, you know, I'm not, my clinic is not that in, in intricate. So I, I, I work very closely with my urologist. We have a great working relationship. So they do all my urodynamics and they're usually done already if they think it's a They've done them in their office if they think this is uh, an issue that they need to address if it's a bladder versus prostate problem. PVR is also important. Um, you want to make sure they have, um, you know, 50 and 100 is acceptable. Um, so those aren't, you know, those may sound like a, a big number, but they're not. So don't, don't pay, you know, it's, often men over 65 have 100 milliliter of post weight residual. So um, that was actually considered normal. Um, and this is kind of an example of how they do it. You know, patients don't really like the urodynamics. You need a, a probe in the bladder and, and a probe in the, through the penis and probe in the rectum. So I've had patients that when I have to send them back for urodynamics after uh, a PAE that wasn't so successful, they, <laughs> you could see their face uh, expression, cha expression change. Um, this is just the tracing from a urodynamic study. Um, this is a ultrasound showing you post void residual. I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of that. Um, and not all, obviously not all LUTs require PAE. You know, if they have a bladder problem, PAE will not fix that. If they have an outlet problem like BPH, it will fix it. But there are other out, uh, problems that can cause outlet obstruction like um, distrusor sphincter dysergia. Again, I don't know much about that. I'll be honest. Um, urethral stricture, that's actually a big one. You know, um, you know, we can actually treat those in a different way. I haven't done any of them, but you can balloon dilate. Um, I don't know if any IRs are doing that, but, you know, typically urologists are very adept at treating urethral strictures. So again, urodynamics is very important. Collaboration with urology, very important. You, you know, and not even just PAE, you want to, um, just a, a word of advice, you know, 
when your when your urologist asks for help, you you want to you want to be able to help them out if you're going to try to start a PAE practice because you're going to need their help. Like if they need a nephrostomy and it's late and they ask you, you know, just, sometimes you got to just do it. Uh, even if you don't want to, or you think you can wait because you want to have that collegial uh, collaborative uh, uh, approach with them. Like I said before, sometimes it's both a bladder problem and an outlet problem. So in those patients, you got to temper their expectations. Um, and sometimes fixing the outlet obstruction makes a patient incontinent when they have a neurogenic bladder. I haven't encountered that yet, but that has happened. Um so some medications can cause primary urgency like anticholinergics and beta-3 agonists. Um, the trues are under activity. Um, these patients need intermittent cath and PAE may help, but um, you know, you, if you're starting off doing PAE, I, I would just stick to the patients who have a nice big prostate and you know that their prostate is causing their obstruction um, and that they don't have any other confounding factors that be causing their lower urine tract symptoms. Um, laboratory work, workup. So, you know, when I first started, I was very uh, strict about having a UA beforehand and a PSA to get a baseline because your PSA will change after prostate artery embolization. Uh, PSA is not a great screening tool, even though we still use it, but because it, it can get be affected, uh, many different uh, things can affect it, like BPH. You have more prostate, you produce more PSA. So um, your PSA can change. It can actually go up after prostate aromatization because you're releasing more from the necrotic um, gland. So it's important to get a baseline. So I always do make sure they have one within the past few months to a year um, beforehand. Uh, your analysis, you know, when you're doing patients who have, uh, who are, Catheter dependent, your analysis is not going to really help. They're going to, it's going to be positive no matter what. They're colonized. You're going to have to culture their, their urine. That takes a few days. So it gets a little, um, a little involved. So what I do now is I'm, I mainly take a good history um, when I consent the patient. Uh, I, I ask all the proper questions. I do I actually have done, started doing a physical exam, pushing on their bladder, especially when they have a catheter, make sure they have no super pubic tenderness. So um, I think a good history and physical exam can, can avoid uh, getting a urinalysis that can cause delays. It can also be kind of um, the results can be equivocal. So that sometimes I see that cause, you know, cause delays and problems. But if you're starting off, I recommend always doing a urinalysis. You know, you don't want to have your first couple that you do and you have a, um, a patient who had prostatitis and you have a uh, prostate abscess, you won't probably get another prostate patient after that. Um, so, so symptoms of area score, I kind of mentioned about the nocturia, you'll see that's question number seven, but this IPSS is a great, um, it's a great objective uh, measure to, to see how, first of all, how severe their symptoms are and how good your results are after. So we want to, we don't want to do any patients less than a um, IPSS of 13 because data shows that their uh, results aren't that great because their obstruction symptoms are not that great, aren't that bad. So you're not going to get, you know, you're not starting with a high number, high, uh, a high score to be able to decrease it enough. And usually I tell patients, I want to get at least 50% improvement in your symptoms, hopefully more, but you know, I'm shooting for 50%. If I have less than 50%, I'm, I, I'm not successful. Um, and it's, that is actually very easy to, um, to discern with nocturia. So if they have, if they're getting up five, six times a night, they come back to you in a few months and they're getting up two to three, that's a win. If they're going one, that's even better. So, um, those are the, some of the questions that I have all the patients answer this, uh, score, uh, take this questionnaire before I see them in clinic, um, and it's very, very helpful. Every single patient will get this on their pre and post visits. Um, this uh, SHIM or IEFF score is just to make sure that they're, you're not worsening their uh, erectile dysfunction because that's a complication of the procedure in case you embolize the wrong artery. Uh, so I have a patient fill that out along with their IPSS uh, questionnaire. Um, so some complications uh, of BPH or uh, obstruction, which is uh, boo, um, acute urinary retention, hematuria, bladder spasms, detrusor failure, upper urinary tract 
obstruction and renal failure, like hydronephrosis. I'm sure you guys have probably seen those patients and sometimes place nephrostomy tubes in them or suprapubic catheter. So, you know, BPH can be, can be pretty severe. It's not just an annoyance for some patients. There's a lot of medical therapies and I'm not going to go through all these drugs, but there's plenty out there. There's a uh, big pharma's involved and making a lot of money in this, um, so, you know, you have your alpha block blockers uh, like Flomax, your 5-alpha alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride, and Cialis is a uh, PD, P, PD, PDE5 inhibitor, um, which relaxes your smooth muscle and like Cialis it can also use for, um, for erectile dysfunction. Um, medical therapy is great when it, when it works, obviously, when it doesn't it doesn't work and it's, you know, patients are not, not happy and they have a lot of uh, side effects. So a lot of patients cannot tolerate it. And that's, and I see a lot of patients come in and I question them like, what have you tried? And they will name all the drugs off and they'll often be like, I feel lightheaded. I'm dizzy. I can't take it. So that's a good indication for you to um, perform a PAE is when they failed medical therapy, but uh, within failure of medical therapy, not tolerating the medicines is also part of that uh, indication. Um, here, this is just some studies that show um, the effectiveness of uh, medical therapy. Um, you know, predict studies showed that combination therapy is better than monotherapy. So you often see these patients on multiple drugs uh, when they do take drugs. Um, so that's, you know, one one uh, drug isn't always enough. Um, and these are the side effects I talked about other than um, the lightheadedness and uh, dizziness. You also can get retrograde ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, headaches fluctuating with the Cialis and Viagras. Um, so, and this last bit is what I just mentioned due to side effects of medications. Um, and non-tolerance of medical therapy. One can argue that you don't necessarily have to fail medical therapy to justify PAE. Um, okay, imaging workup, ultrasound. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of urologists will perform ultrasounds in their clinic. They're they're good at measuring the size um, of the prostate. You know, you can get a good post void residual. Um, there's a, a, you can do a transurethral ultrasound. Um, I prefer uh, CTA. So um, I have a special a protocol that I uh, found online where I where patients get um, sublingual nitroglycerin about five or 10 minutes before their scan and then immediately when they're on the table prior to getting their uh, the contrast. Um, it's, it's great at uh, showing you the anatomy. And I recommend if you're starting off doing these, always make sure every patient gets a CTA. It doesn't always help you, but when it does, it's very helpful because there are, we'll go over some various anatomies and um, it's good to know that in advance, you'll save yourself a lot of time and frustration when you can't find the prostate, prostate artery on one side because it's coming off the inferior epigastric or some other random place. Or there's, sometimes I've seen patients with two prostate arteries on one side, especially the ones with very, very large prostates, they recruit more vascularity. Um, there's some IRs out there that will do a MRI with prostate protocol. You know, you can't see the, the small uh, prostate arteries well on MRI. So um, that helps you rule out cancer, gives, uh, gives you a better estimate of prostate size. I do calculate prostate size on CTA, but obviously, as you probably know, CT is not, is not as good as MRI with tissue differentiation. So it's kind of hard to tell the difference of when, when does the prostate end, when does the rectum start, when does the prostate end and the bladder starts, when they have um, you know, uh, a thickened bladder wall from bladder outlet obstruction. So, but you can get a pretty good estimate, especially when you can correlate it with an ultrasound um, that they probably already have done if they're coming from a urologist office. So here's that protocol I mentioned. I'm not going to really go into it. Um, so there's some people who don't do a CTA um, and they'll just do a comb beep CT on the table. So you can do it from the um, from the anterior division where it's usually uh, the prostate arteries come off of, but there are uh, sometimes where prostate arteries come off the posterior division. So you'll kind of have to, you won't, you, it's hard to get a good cone bean CT um, 
I think it's harder to get uh, the granular anatomy of their prostate arteries or the cone beam CT is what I'm trying to say. Because you you have to, the, the more distal you are, the better your, your, um, your, your results of your CT and the more information you can get from it. So um, that's why I like a CTA. So, but I do perform a cone beam CT once I'm in the prostate artery to be able to first make sure there's no non-target embolization and second to make sure I'm covering the entire hemiprostate globe uh, and ensuring that there's no other uh, supply from somewhere else. Um, so you make sure again, you're also always doing cone beam CTs, whether you're doing it instead of a CTA or once you're in a prostate gland, you should at least at the minimum do it when you're in a prostate artery and confirm, uh, that you're in the proper arterial distribution. Um, I've done a couple of cases where I, you know, now that I'm, I've done the more and more you do, you, you, you become more adept at knowing what the anatomy looks like, the staining, um, and when there's non-target embolization. So, um, but I still, you know, 90% of the time will perform, a, a cone beam CT. So you want to look for prostate staining and I'll show you some examples of it. Um, you want to have a, a slow frame rate or a high frames per second. Um, you want to look for tortuosity within the prostate uh, gland that the vessels are yearly cor corkscrews. It's kind of similar to a uh, uterine artery. And you want to look for washout to indicate uh, non-prostate tissue. So the prostate should stain with your contrast on your delayed um, angio. Um, so, so you can do a cone beam CT and you place it above the aortic bifurcation and get a good, you know, get a decent anatomy, uh, picture of your, where your prostate arteries of it. That's some people do that. Um, I like to plan everything in advance, make sure I, uh, I have a kind of an, uh, a map of where I'm going before I start. All right. Now we'll talk about some surgical options, uh, cause not, you shouldn't treat every patient that comes into your clinic. Um, again, you want to, you want to be collegial with your with your urologist. You also want to throw them bones too. If you're getting patients to uh, direct, uh, refer to you directly. Um, open prostatectomy. So the big prostates you often see in your clinic, the other treatment for them besides PAE is open prostatectomy. Biggest problem with that is retrograde ejaculation along with other you know, comorbidities uh, that a patient may have that will lead them to be a, a, a curious for surgery. Um, TERP, this is the gold standard for BPH. This is what you'll see a lot of our literature compare PAE is to TERP. Um, and, you know, we're, we're pretty pretty close to, to having short-term data that's uh, equivalent to TERP, although some urology data kind of contradicts that. But um, we, don't, we don't have very long-term, great long-term data yet. Um, it's not having been doing it for that long. So... Um, basically I described the patient, you go in there, it's like a rotor rooter, you get a wire loop electrode and you just start removing the, uh, obstructing tissue. They can also have retrograde ejaculation is pretty common here. And a lot of men will not like that. Um, green light and homeum laser. That's, uh, um, another minimally invasive treatment, um, transurethral microwave therapy. I don't really know anyone that does that, but that's another uh, minimally invasive therapy, and that's kind of a picture of there how they do it. Um, similar to our microwave ablations. Um, Urolift, this is surprisingly gaining a lot of traction. Um, it's pretty novel. I think it invol involves two procedures. So a plant, kind of a, like a Y90 that we do, plant you plant it um, with a cystoscopy to see um, where they got to tack up the the prostatic lobes, and then the second procedure that they got to actually do the tacking. Um, Probably why it's getting so much popularity is you can do it in an office on the local prostate block. It's not, it's very, very minimally invasive. Um, so, but the results I've seen haven't been that great. So this lift study showed no difference in PVR after year lift, uh, but there is a 10 point IPSS benefit. Um, fortunately, the five-year IPSS improvement is only 36% and 13% of patients require treatment at five years which I, I think it's actually higher than that in, in, in real life. I've seen a lot of patients that have had Urolift, not a lot, but a, bu a bunch of patients who have Urolift that need a repeat procedure. And we've only seen one patient that had a TERP that needed a repeat procedure, but that, that was also you know, over 10 years of, that they had their TERP. Uh, Rezoom, this is uh, similar to ablation. It uses steam. Um, 
to uh, ablate. Um, so water and steam also can be done in the in the office. Um, this way, Zoom two study showed eleven point IPSS benefit, two year improvement, fifty one percent. Um, I guess they, we, we don't have any long term data yet. Um, six percent with new ejaculatory dysfunction and four point four percent had retreatment at two years. Oops, sorry. Aqua ablation. Um, I don't really know the difference between that and the resume, but that's another minimally invasive procedure. Um, so here are some of the uh, indications for these other uh, minimally invasive procedures. Urolift, small prostate. It actually does work really well for small prostate, and they do, they should not have a median lobe. They have a median lobe, usually they need TERP. Um, and it's it's good because you when if you have a patient with a small prostate, you probably don't want to be starting off with those. So you can easily refer those back to the urologist, or if you got those directly from the PCP or the patient, you can you know tell your urologist, oh, look, I have a patient for you. Maybe, maybe they're a good candidate for Urolift. Um, make your make your referring urologist happy. Um, Rezoom is also good for prostate, smaller prostates, and they can have a median lobe. Um, again, alcohol ablation, I don't know too much about, but I've heard that it's any size prostate and also okay with a median lobe. All right, so the benefits of our procedure, um, low risk of erectile dysfunction, you know, we're not going through the urethra, we're not touching the sphincter. Um, so we, we don't have, um, sorry, that the sphincter issues, the low, low risk of urine incontinence. Um, erectile dysfunction, you know, we're not touching the penis at all. Uh, retrograde ejaculation, again, nothing going, nothing through your urethra, sphincter is intact. Um, faster recovery. You know, there's almost no recovery sometimes with these patients. I will talk about how I um, treat uh, treat their pain afterwards, but some patients I've seen in clinic, they've had, they had zero pain after. Or what I say you may have, what you may feel is if you rode an uncomfortable bike seat for too long, kind of having that that discomfort in your in your groin or your your perineum area, um, or if you've ever had, or if you can ask a patient if they've ever had prostatitis, it's similar a similar feeling. <clears throat> so um, there's uh, so you get good success with larger prostates, um, hematuria, and um, patients with uh, urinary retention, acute, acute urinary retention or even chronic urinary retention. Um, all right, so PAE indications, moderate sized, uh, moderate IPSS score. So you wanna make sure they're over um, 13, like I mentioned before, failed medical therapy. You know, you'll see this three month number been thrown out, but if they can't tolerate the, the medicine, then that counts too, it's just failed medical therapy. Um, you want their your flow rate less than 10 milliliters, um, PVR greater than 100. So you want to make sure they're retaining some some urine. Prostate size over 50. I highly highly recommend do not start your first 10 patients. Don't ever do a patient less than 50. I I tried that. I you know I was doing pretty good with my first five. So I thought oh let's let's try some smaller prostates. I never went below 50, but even like 50 to 60 can be a challenge. The prostate arteries are smaller. And the results aren't going to be as good. So you may have some unhappy patients. Um, median lobe, you know, classically we talked about is less than three centimeters. But again, I want to reiterate that the size is not what should drive you when you're looking at the median lobe. It should be the configuration and the ratio of how big their median lobe is compared to their lateral lobes. Um, so this is a picture. Uh, sorry, uh, I'll go back here. This is a, a picture. Preembolization, you can see the staining of the prostate gland. Um, you can see a Foley catheter here. Um, and postembolization, you know, you don't want to totally destroy the whole prostate artery. Uh, you want to make sure you don't have any visualization of intraprostatic collaterals. So you can see the difference there. Um, this is uh, PA indications from a urologist's perspective. One per surgical candidate, urinary retention, indwelling bladder catheter. Those are excellent patients to start with. If you get one of those, you know, you can easily show how, how good our procedure is when the catheter can come out. Um, refractive hematuria, prostate origin, another great indication. Um, you can, you'll see results immediately on the spot. I've done this for patients in the hospital who just had continuous bladder irrigation for days and, you know, they can't get out of the hospital. You do a PAE, they're discharged the next day. 
Um, <clears throat> prior surgical history or person uh, kind of goes along with poor surgical candidates um, and a large slash giant prostate. The bigger they, the prostate is, the better it is. So I would tell my patients, you know, especially the ones with the huge prostate, you have a huge prostate. That's what I love. Um, they find that kind of funny when you kind of make jokes, can make a joke about their huge prostate. Um, from the patient perspective, is there men who don't want or are ineligible for surgery? Men who've tried medications but found ineffective or side effects are too, uh, are, uh, too much for them? And men who want to avoid high risk of possible adverse effects like retrograde ejaculation, um, impotence, or urinary continence. Um, and then you, know, you, you can kind of mention the men who wish you to preserve fertility. Yes, men can have uh, children at any age. Um, so this does preserve their per, uh, fertility because we don't get rid of the entire prostate gland or even most of it. We're more make, making it more softer um, to allow for the prostate for the prostate reason to work better than we're actually necrosing tissue. So you're not going to see m m many uh, patients like this. Um, I've seen one. Um, so um, contraindications. I see infection. You don't want to be embolizing a field that's um, already has uh, colonized with bacteria. Uh, patient with prostate cancer, although there are some, there's some research uh, and some papers you'll see in JVIR talking about embolization for prostate cancer, but uh, that's not ready for, for prime time treatment yet. Uh, bladder cancer, um, chronic renal failure, you know, you have to give them contrast, so you don't really want to be treating those patients. Um, any patient with a bladder problem, it's not going to solve their problem. Uh, bladder stones, um, obstruction that's not due to BPH, or severe vessel tortuosity or severe atherosclerosis. This is actually another good one, um, why, uh, a good reason why to get why you want to get a CTA because if you do a cone beam CT, you're not going to know that they have severe vessel tortuosity or severe atherosclerosis beforehand. So you just wasted this patient's time and you got to cancel the procedure because you can't get in the arteries. Um, and I've seen, you know, in Colorado where uh, patients here are pretty healthy, so we don't see too much atherosclerotic disease, um, but, you, you know, it's very prevalent in the United States. So it's, that's why I, I, again, another reason I highly advocate to get a CTA beforehand. All right, patients, if you want to just say no to IPSS less than 12, uh, patients who have prostatitis um, have a high PVR, but their IPSS score isn't that high. They're just, you know, their symptoms are, are not that bad. Uh, small prostates and median lobe. Again, don't concentrate too much on the number. May look at the ratio and the configuration. Okay, here's some data. There have also been some new some new studies that um, um, I don't think I put in this, but we can kind of discuss that too. So in 2013, this is a Chinese randomized controlled trial, TERP versus PAE. Um, in early on, TERP has an advantage. Obviously, you're taking out the tissue right there. We're waiting for an addition to cross. That can take up to three months. So this paper showed that there's no difference after six months. Um, and um, there, they actually stated that there are greater complications with PAE, but this is early on in their um, experience. And um, clinical and technical failures and post embolization syndrome were included as PAE complications. And we all know that those aren't real complications. So I wouldn't um, take put too much light into that uh, that outcome. Um, this is a big study um, by Carnavale, um, who compared TERP to PAE, um, and they used this perfected technique where you um, embolize proximally first, and after stasis you advance the catheter and perform additional uh, embolization. Just kind of opposite of what we would think about, but. But if you think about it more, you know, it kind of makes sense. You're embolizing proximally, and then you're going distally and pushing the embolization material more distally. Um, and um, I try to do that. It does actually work better. Um, this is just anecdotal, but I, I do believe in the perfected technique. Um, sometimes it's not possible, especially with really torturous prostate arteries. Um, importantly, though, it was not randomized. So um, that's one uh, factor against that study. Uh, Russo et al. Uh, looked at PAE versus open prostatectomy. Uh, PAE had a 13-point IPSS benefit and it showed durable results. Um, obviously, you see, you're know, taking out the whole prostate, it's going to have better results no matter what, but it is, uh, it is more invasive and um, patients don't really like that. 
Uh, Pisco et al. had a long-term follow-up, but still only six and a half years. Uh, it showed PE is durable. Uh, I found um, this, the study though was very, uh, the sample size is very small, but they followed eight patients to six and a half years and 76% effective at six and a half years. Um, this is a systemic systematic review. Uh, PAE shows a 14 point IPSS benefit. Only one patient had a major complication rate of non-target embolization across the major manual analysis. Um, Bati et al. looked at large glands with high comorbidity patients, um, catheter-dependent patients, and 86% of patients had the catheter removed in 18 days. Um, Pisco et al. had another uh, study in 2016, uh, showed that P is durable, IPSS, uh, so they wanted to make sure, include the patients that had IPSS improvement in 15 scores or more, 25% um, uh, or 25% decrease in their IPSS quality of life, uh, which is part of the IPSS questionnaire. Uh, it's also very important. Sorry, I forgot to mention that, but you want to see um, their quality of life go down to less than three or decrease by one um, and not needing any medical therapy. Sorry, I meant IPSS. You want the patients that showed a good response were the ones that had their IPSS score on follow-up less than 15. So those uh, when a one to three success one to three year success rate was eighty two percent and three the six and a half year success rate was seventy six percent so pretty pretty durable um, especially even compared to some of the minimally invasive studies like your uh, procedures like Eurolift that the urologists do um, this is a randomized controlled trial PA versus two a TERP two year outcomes showed marked improvement in uh, less uh, obstruction with PAE associated with less adverse effects. Um, improvements of subjective and objective numbers are superior after uh, TERP. So um, there's kind of some data going against um, our procedure. But, um, you know, the most important thing is these patients have much less adverse effects, retrograde ejaculation, erectile dysfunction, or urinary incontinence. This does not happen without procedure. And this is very appealing to patients. Um, the limitation of the study was it was a rather small success rate of PAE 75% as compared to other studies. So you can imagine if you're only getting a technical success rate of three out of four patients, you know, your outcome, your numbers are going to be affected. And it's a small sample size too. Um, so in summary P of the PA data, the major complication rate is uh, very, very low, uh, less than 0.5%. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm doing okay on time then. I am. Um, TERP slash open prostatectomy is more effective in the short term, and PAE is effective in reducing their lower urinary tract symptoms, and it's durable at uh, six and a half years. Ex uh, so what patients should expect after PAE? Improvement in lower tract, urinary tract symptoms of about 14 to 15 points by PS IPSS. I also say about 15%, 50% improvement. Um, that's what, what we're striving at. Improvement in nocturia they get up one to two times less per night. Again, I'm still striving for 50%. Um, but very important to tell these patients, you will never eliminate their, their symptoms. They will never have a prostate like they did when they were 20 years old, no matter what surgery they do. If, even if they have an open prostatectomy, you don't have a prostate anymore, great, but you have all these other problems that you may encounter. Um, so I guess if you do want to have, you want to go back to like when you were 20 years old, open prostatectomy would be the closest. Um, so these are some examples of embolics. Um, we have various embolics out there. And you probably had lectures, uh, other embolization lectures that went over this. Um, I use embospheres or trisex acryl gelatin microspheres. Um, we'll kind of go over some of the different sizes. Um, traditionally, you either use 100 to 300 microspheres or 300 to 500 micro microspheres. Um, so there was a study done that actually pretty good and showed that there was um, no difference in pain or adverse events between the 100 versus 200, but there was improved clinical success with 200 micron. 26 studies showed that there were 100 to 300 micron microspheres had more pain and adverse events than the 300 to 500 micron microspheres. So you may have a better outcome, but you have more adverse effects. So I, I, you kind of have to weigh that. I, pref I use the 300 to 500 uh, microspheres. Um, I'd rather have patients that are happy 
um, and don't have any complications and patients who are really happy with the result, but now they have other issues that they're dealing with. That's just a personal preference of mine. I think if I have to ever repeat a patient I'm, I, um, that I've done, I haven't had to do it yet, um, but I think I have one that um, was one I mentioned with Alzheimer's that I might have, that I might try. I might try the, three, the 100 to 300 micron microspheres on that patient. Um, again, what size and bollock? So the intranodal arteries measure about 311 microns, um, 155 to 555. The perinodal arteries measure about 145 and the intranodal arteries um, the mean is 56. Sorry. I don't really know. There's two. Oh, internodal versus internodal. Yeah. Um, so basically the, the more you get inside the prostate, deeper inside the prostate, your vessels obviously get smaller. So, um, there's no evidence of which artery, uh, which particle size you should use. The jury is out. Um, you won't be faulted uh, for either one of them. But I would not go uh, any bigger than 300 to 500 micron microspheres. So some things to consider during the procedures. Um, you do not need to hold their anticoagulation or antiplatelets. Um, now we're not even holding it with femoral access, but I do a lot of these radial, so you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, they don't need a Foley, but I always use a Foley. Um, it really helps you localize the prostate. I put a little contrast in there. So I just, you know, any added uh, benefit um, really, really helps and decreases procedure time. Um, so you want your initial imaging to be a steep uh, ipsilateral oblique. That's why I bolded this. You really wanna make sure uh, you're doing ipsilateral oblique that lays out the prostate artery nicely. Um, so you want at least a minimum of 30. So I've been going even higher than 30, um, but 30 is kind of where you wanna shoot, shoot to. Uh, no pun intended. Um, so you have your um, urethral branches that supply the transition zone and the capsular branches that supply the peripheral zone. Um, and you can have some uh, rectal and anal um, collaterals there. So what you're really trying to target is the urethral branches. That's the tissue that you want, necrose that you want to soften up to be able to have the patient urinate better. Um, so here's kind of an example. Um, of what we're talking about, um, there's a, uh, a rectal anal anastomosis um, right there with that um, solid arrow. Um, there's also, you can have a vesicular branch that comes off the, um, the prostate artery. Um, so this is a angiogram of the prostate artery, the, the prostate artery proper that was selected. You can see the the median, the medial and capsular branches split nicely there. Um, so, you know, when I'm doing these procedures, I'm trying to get both of them, but I'm also making sure that I don't have any collateral collateralization to the rectum or anus or bladder. Um, you know, if, uh, I don't really distinguish. It's kind of difficult to uh, get into them, into each one of them and do them separately. So, but the perfect, in the perfected technique, um, I'll usually embolize from that, um, that, uh, first arrow, the thin arrow, um, and then I'll kind of advance my catheter to the, um, to the open arrow that shows the, uh, the medial branches rather than the, uh, the capsular uh, branches that as that uh, thick white arrow. Um, so here's an anatomy. Um, sorry, it's a little, a little blurry. Um, and um, let's see if I have, okay, here's a better picture. So those are the arrows show the prostate artery. A good sign that you want to start looking for is the crossing obturator sign. The prostate artery often, I'd say about 90%, maybe not that high, 80 to 90% of the time will cross the obturator artery. So that's called the crossing obturator sign. When you see that, um, you know you're in you know, likely the right spot. And the, the obturator, you can see here in this picture, usually has a, a pitchfork appearance. Um, you know, it branches into two two branches when it goes kind of um, through the uh, obturator canal. So that's how you can tell uh, what the obturator artery is. Um, there's a high variation of um, prostate artery anatomy, as you can see here. Um, the most common origin is um, the inferior 
vesicular artery, so a combined trunk with the bladder artery and the um, prostate artery, so VP trunk. Um, and then um, next uh, after that is the um, internal pudendal artery. And then um, obturator artery is, is less common when it comes off the operator, obturator, but oftentimes you'll still see it kind of loop across and uh, uh, double over over the, its origin if it comes off the prostate artery. So it'll have like a reverse S course. Um, so it kind of circled here, the more common um, origins of the prostate artery. Um, common trunk with the uh, superior vesicular artery, again, is like 28%. Um, so these are just some other examples. It, just the main thing, you know, it's going to be difficult for you to remember these different anatomies, um, different branching types. You know, it's just important to, to know that there can be much vari very variable anatomy. It's much different than uh, performing a uterine artery embolization. Uh, it takes much more time and studying of anatomy. Um, so when I'm reading out my CTAs, if I'm the one reading them, I don't really talk about what type it is. I'll just say the origin or, um, you know, where... Uh, where the branching type, uh, branching anatomy is. Is it coming off the anterior division separately? Is it coming off the pudendal? So I don't even bother with memorizing the the types, but you may have your attendings who want to pimp you on the, what type they are. So they, you may want to kind of brush up on it. Um, so this is an example of a type one common trunk with the superior vesicular artery. Um, you can see this is a more of a trifurcation um, because the, some, the, the uh, superior vesicular artery often has two branches. Um, this is uh, the same angiogram with the prostate artery cannulized. You'll often have uh, branches that supply the seminal vesicle arteries. Uh, seminal ves vesicle, that's uh, nothing to worry about. You can embolize that uh, with impunity. Um, Another example of a common trunk with the um, superior vesicular artery, and there's an inferior vesicular branch uh, here, um, where um, the prostate artery comes off of. Um, this is another example of, here's another example. Um, the prostate artery is the smaller solid arrow, uh, more inferiorly. You can see how it's tortuous, kind of corkscrew. Um, so you want to look for these, these three branches. You have the umbilical uh, branch, because usually, like I said, a trifurcation. Um, it's straight and upgoing. Um, there's an inferior vesicular um, that crosses midline, because that's where the bladder is. So it's going to cross midline. It'll be higher than the, uh, the Foley catheter. If you're going to be using Foley catheters in your, in your, uh, procedures. And then the prostate artery is a torturous one. It's going to be much more torturous than any of these other branches. Here's another good example. And you can see the prostate artery is cannulized and you'll see staining of the prostate. Um, this is type two. It's internal. It's a, arises separately from the internal like, artery distal to the superior vesicular artery. So um, you can see the superior vesicular artery as uh, an umbilical artery U is uh, superior to the prostate artery. Um, let's start going a little quicker here. Type three, this is coming off the obturator artery. You can see that pitchfork or branching two branches of the obturator artery once it goes through the obturator canal and the prostate artery comes off of it. But you could see it's an S-shaped, so it kind of still wants to do that crossing obturator sign. Um, it may not cross it fully, but it's getting close. Um, another example of the uh, prostate artery coming off the obturator artery. Now, this one obviously is not crossing it because it's pretty distal origin off the obturator. Um, and that's an example of it cannulated. Um, and actually this is, I think, sorry, I don't know this label, but I think this is a picture of an embolized obturator artery because the obturator is supposed to supply the pubic symphysis along with other um, tissue that you don't want to embolize. This is kind of cute picture. You could see uh, the, the prostate artery doing a heart shape. So it's, it's again, crossing the obturator. Remember that crossing operator sign. And this is a cannulated. 
Um, um, this is type three obturator artery. Um, you know, rarely the obturator origin originates from the external iliac, but if you don't see um, the typical obturator artery, you want to go investigate the external iliac artery. We still haven't had one of the prostate artery coming off the external iliac artery. Um, this is type four coming off the pudendal. Again, you can see the crossing obturator sign. And here you can see some some flow to the to the bladder. Um, so there are some you know collaterals that can can pass out of the bladder. So be careful. You know that's why it's, again it's important to do a uh, comb beam CT. Um, this is just some other uh, various anatomy. Let's see, is this one coming off? Um, the excessive is coming off an accessory pudendal artery. I've actually seen that before. Um, and you can see here that. Um, be careful of the accessory pudendal artery when the origin of the prostate artery off an accessory pudendal because it often will supply the penis. You don't want to send any microspheres into the penis because you will end up in court. Um, and here is a comb beam CT of the penile artery being opacified. Um, people often will coil the penile artery. Um, you know, talking to my urology colleagues, um, they're a little, con they think this is a controversial, although I know a lot of people will do it, but, um, I won't do this. I, I often will ask if I'm worried that the prostate area and has kind of common origin with the accessory pudendal or has any flow to the uh, penis. I will, before I decide to embolize, I will ask the patient how concerned they are about erectile dysfunction, um, because I don't want to make their erectile dysfunction worse, you know, erectile dysfunction, the pathophysiology is from um, an arterial issue. So you theoretically, you can make it worse by uh, cutting off more blood supply to the uh, penile artery, although there's a lot of collateralization. Um, so this is some more on that. Okay, this is, a, this is a rare one. I haven't seen this yet. This is coming off the in, uh, prostate artery, coming off the inferior gluteal artery. This one's coming off the superior gluteal artery. Um, uh, common rectal prosthetic trunk. So rectal artery is that squ squiggly arrow um, feeding the rectum. Um, let's see what else. Oh, patients can have multiple uh, prostate arteries, as I had mentioned before. Um, you can see this one has an origin off the inferior vesicular artery, uh, inferior in, in, internal pudendal artery, um, sorry, internal pudendal artery and a VP, VP trunk. This often happens with a uh, very large prostate. You can kind of see the staining a little bit here that the prostate is pretty large in this patient. Um, let's see, this is just another one showing um, multiple prostate arteries. You can see that the, um, the kind of squiggly arteries are many of them and the prostate is pretty large in this patient. Um, and this is staining of the, you can see the staining of the prostate gland. All right, some more procedural considerations. Be wary of the straight artery in the prostate. Um, they should usually have corkscrew appearance. Straight vessels usually supply the rectum or penis. You don't want to embolize those. Beware of anastomosis with the internal pudendal and rectal arteries. Again, don't want to embolize those arteries. Beware of the common vesicular prosthetic trunk. Um, you can see the, uh, the vesicular artery is usually draped over the bladder. You can really see that well when you're using a uh, Foley catheter because the um, vesicular artery is usually above or like directly over your um, Foley balloon. And it crosses the midline. That's another important thing. A prostate artery usually will not cross the, the midline. It, there are intraprosthetic collaterals. So you can have some cross uh, filling cr crossing the midline, but you should not have the, uh, pay, uh, the parent artery going across midline. Um, okay, so anatomy summary. When the three vessels are present on the VP trunk, prostate is the in posterior inferior one. Obturator origins usually have a, a reverse curve origin in a horizontal segment. Um, the terminal internal pudendal origins missed on internal iliac injections if DSA is ended prematurely. And um, straight vessels, avoid them at all costs. Um, avoid uh, arteries that cross the midline. And, um, you know, if there's a large inflow 
artifact, it's usually from the rectum because the rectum has supply from the um, inferior mesenteric artery. So you can have blood coming from the inferior mesenteric artery, which is um, causing artifact, flow artifact in, in your, on your angiogram. So be aware of that. And one thing I, I actually should add is um, what I kept saying is a crossing operator sign um, that's not on here. Okay, so access. I do. I, I try to start all patients radially. Um, they have early mobility, the decreases of hematoma. Patients love it. Um, only negative is you can't really do it in taller people, although our catheters are getting longer and longer. Um, but your um, pushability may be limited. Um, femoral access, um, you know, catheter length is not, not a problem. Um, it's also beneficial in patients with torturous thoracic abdominal aortas. So that's another benefit of having a CTA before your procedure. You can see how torturous their arteries are. And I have had patients, you know, who've had, you know, a horizontal appearing uh, comedian artery, which I know is going to be much, very difficult to get good pushability from, from the wrist. So I do do them femoral. Um, this is just some sample equipment. I used a 125 centimeter Berenstein catheter. My microcatheter of choice is the um, burn true select catheter, but you know, you can pick and choose what you want. Um, let's see. Um, so we're, again, we mentioned DSA from the internal iliac artery, steep oblique, at least 30 degrees. Uh, you want to do four for eight or five for 10 DSA. You don't want to have too much uh, too much contrast. Um, you're, you don't have that much tissue in that region. Um, if your rate's too high, you're going to have reflux into your, um, your uh, external iliac artery, which can um, kind of make your uh, DSA a little more challenging to interpret. Um, if you have the benefit of using um, your roadmap or overlay, um, so you don't want to have much um, reflux into your external iliac artery because that can make it harder. Um, if, you're not, if you don't visualize the prostate artery, perform an external iliac injection to evaluate for anomalous external iliac operator or organ as we um, discussed before. Um, you want to hand inject from the, uh, from the prostate artery. You don't, don't, want, don't over inject. Um, uh, when your their vessels are very small and delicate, I've actually perforated a prostate artery branch before. Um, I do administer nitro whenever I can because the arteries are small. I want to get as much embolic in there as possible. Um, make sure you embolize with uh, diluted particles. So I use a 10 to 1 mixture. So embospheres, if you take out all the um, allutant, uh, which is normal saline from the syringe, you'll have left about 2 mLs of beads. So I had nine mLs of contrast and nine mLs of saline, um, and it works pretty well uh, in that ratio. Consider doing the perfected technique. Um, and I used to do gel foam. You know, this is not, not essential, but um, you can gen gel foam the internal iliac arteries when you're done if, if you want to uh, improve your results. But I think with if you're, if you're able to do the perfected technique, uh, I think gel foam is just overkill. Um, here's some microcatheters. There's a uh, Merit Maestro prograde direction, and um, again, I didn't put on here the. There's a new Boston Scientific uh, True Select. Very, very. It's two point zero French. Um, it is uh, tracks very nicely. It's very hydrophilic, so um, that's that's my go-to catheter now for prostates. Um, these are some different wires. Oh, the Synchrosoft. Um, it's like a fathom, but softer. So um, keep that in your toolbox. If you if you're running out of if you, you know you're having issues advancing your wire because um, it is too tortuous, um, ask you know make sure you have a synchro soft on on the table. It's a nice nice neural wire. Um, this is a good tool for difficult catheterization. Uh, the Swift Ninja. Um, you, one drawback is it's it's only one twenty twenty five centimeter working length. So if you're going radially, you're not going to be able to use it. So you can only do it femorally, but it's a catharkable catheter that you can direct very well, much better than direction microcatheter. Um, it is a little bit bigger, a 2.4 French. So, um, but it can really help you cannulate those difficult prostate arteries. Um, there's some occlusion, 
occlusion catheters that are anti-reflux. If you have um, some uh, non-target vessels that are very close to your origin of your prostate artery, you can kind of um, play around with those. Um, okay, complications. So some early complications like patients can have UTI, prostatitis. Um, I often put these patients on a week to 10 days of, well, I always do, of um, like something like Cipro, um, or something that covers urine um, to prevent any prostatitis. I always give them antibiotics before the procedure too. Um, failure obviously is a complication, non-target embolization. If you're very careful, this should never happen. Um, and then uh, patients can actually pass tissue from their urethra, which I've never seen, but I've, I, it has been reported in the literature. Um, they can also have um, hematuria or hematospermia. Um, that's not really a complication. That's actually a good sign of uh, necrosis, but you wanna warn your patients in case they do. Um, I have gotten a call from a patient early on that was very, uh, very uh, freaked out because he did have hematospermia and um, I failed to mention that that was part of his, uh, part of what can happen. Um, so major complications, you don't ever wanna see this, uh, bladder ischemia, rectal ischemia, penile ischemia, um, radiation burn and ulcers if you're using too much, too high of a radiation dose. Post-procedural management, um, I usually remove the Foley less than two hours after the procedure. I usually just do it on, on the table if you're using a Foley. Um, you want to make sure they can urinate before you discharge them because um, another complication is um, acute urinary retention from all the inflammation of the, uh, the prostate gland. You want to make sure they stop their prostate medications one week post-procedure. Uh, post you don't want, there are certain medications um, that you know, and if you, you know, we can go over which ones those are, not in this presentation, but um, that you don't want to stop immediately at, at, after the procedure because they, they can cause acute urinary retention. Um, if fully dependent pre-procedure attempt removal at two weeks, your urologist can, uh, can help you do that um, with avoiding trial. Um, so this is kind of uh, a rubric for what most people do for follow-up. I typically, um, I I I do a phone call at one month, and now and a clinic visit at three months because three months is when your symptom improvement is the best. That's the peak of their um, IPSS uh, questionnaire improvement. Um, and then um, I don't follow the patients after after that unless they have an issue or they're um, going in the wrong direction with their symptoms. Um, so medications I. Am, after the procedure, I would give them uh, naproxen, 500 milligrams BID for a week, and um, I don't I don't give narcotics. I've never had to use narcotics, and I rarely give them a mental dose pack unless they're still complaining of pain after. But I will reserve narcotics for any patients that are refractory to the first two, um, and then also an antibiotic. Um, I don't think it's yeah here that it is on there. So. And there's various uh, medications you can help for other um, side effects like dysuria. Um, well, they can have it from uh, the Foley catheter actually. So phenazopyridine um, is a good one to use. Uh, some patients can have a lot of frequency after that. that's actually common. Another good thing to make, make mention if you're your patient, you are causing inflammation and inflammation can make these patients urinate more. You can prescribe them best of care. Um, Obstipation if they're can't uh, if they're taking um, opioids. Um, though there's the hematospermia and uh, hematuria. Um, I've never seen rectal bleeding, um, but uh, theoretically that can happen. Um, so again, I give them the uh, cipro BID, um, and the urinary retention can happen. Approximately two percent of patients. I haven't had one yet. Um, but if that does happen, you have to have their Foley in, keep their Foley in for about two to three days. So this is the standard uh, regimen I use, Cipro 500 milligrams BID and Naproxen 500 milligrams BID. It's easy for the patients to remember, both are BID, both are 500 milligrams. So um, the patients can remember, can remember one med, they can remember two. Um, and then additional medications as needed for symptomatology. Um, so 
this is a you know PA failure um, again you know that that's rare. I'm going to kind of skip that. Um, if you ever have to repeat PA, um, I haven't had to yet, um, but I may. So look for that patent vessel in case you're for some reason your box didn't stick. You may have to reembolize. Uh, look for neovascularity if you're if your prostate arteries are well uh, embolized, look for other collaterals. And, you know, repeat PAE is a little controversial. It has variable success depending on anatomy, but I think it's worth a try, especially with patients that are high risk surgical candidates or don't want surgery. You're not really going to lose much, you know, by trying it again. So I, I say go for it if you have a patient that's complicated, like, for example, my uh, uh, Alzheimer's patient who may have other issues going on, but you know, it could be that there are other collaterals or um, neovascularity or your, um, uh, your vessel wasn't fully embolized. So, um, you know, something to consider. Um, you want to reestablish a baseline uh, PSA. Uh, PSA will ultimately decrease after PAE, but initially will increase. Uh, you are inflaming the prostate, so you will raise more PSA. Um, you decrease the volume of the prostate, so that's why the PA say should decrease. Um, PSA, but important to remember, decreased PSA does not equate to decreased risk for prostate cancer. PSA is not a great screening tool, um, but it is still used as a screening tool. Um, prostate size reduction, your patients sometimes ask you about this. You often can get 30 to 40% size reduction, but again, it's more mainly kind of necrosing that uh, periurethral tissue or the medial, uh, the yeah, the, the periurethral tissue to allow the, the prosthetic urethra to, to function uh, normally again or somewhat normally. More importantly, it's the symptoms, not the size of the prostate. Um, so that's about it. I want to just give some thanks to my uh, partner, John Lindquist, uh, who helped me. Um, he kind of started this presentation, did most of it, and I kind of piggybacked on it. So uh, special thanks to him. Um, now, can we, do we have time for questions? Um, I think we had two hours for this. So uh, Dave uh, um, or Emily, I don't know if we, we do have time for questions or not. Yeah, I think that if, if people are able to hang on or have any questions, we can open up to questions if people either wanna add things into the chat or the Q and A. Um, that was great. A lot of the questions that I had kind of like brainstormed ahead of time, you covered during the course of that. Um, but I'll see if anyone has any questions, um, in the chat. Okay. Let me try to get back to, and also if, here's my email address. If you guys have any questions that you want to ask now or think of any later, um, I can't see any, the questions. So Emily, are you going to be shouting yeah, them out? Yeah, I'm kind of watching the board. Um, anyone has any, feel free to um, add them to the chat. Um, I'll just ask, I know you had briefly mentioned that you're getting many of your referrals from primary care physicians or self-referrals from the patients themselves. Is there anything you've really done to um, help gain these referrals or anything you do in, with urology to maybe get some referrals from your urology colleagues? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, I'm sure other people have that same question. So first with urology, um, talk to your urologist, obviously, you know, uh, I'm very lucky in my hospital, we have a physician's lounge. That's kind of not as common anymore. We're always sitting around chatting and you'll find patients that, you know, you'll hear about patients that your urologists say, you know, oh, it's going to be a difficult prostate It's really large. So, you know, you can pick up on that, um, help your, pro your urologists out. Again, like I mentioned before, if there's a semi-indicated or kind of, uh, nephrostomy or it's in the middle of the night and you think you can wait, but they're really asking for it and it's safe to do and it's reasonable, just, you know, just bite the bullet and go ahead and do it. They, they will remember that. Um, they will, they will repay you. Um, so they're going to help you out. You got to help them out back. You want to have a collegial approach. Now for PCPs, I actually reach out to them, uh, to the neighboring PCPs in the area that I, that I work with. Um, I've given them this lecture. I've given uh, this lecture to Grand Rounds. Um, so just be out there, just be out there talking to them, you know, not just PAE, you should do that with any procedure that you want to do. Um, uh, oftentimes, you know, 
they don't know about half the stuff we do, the stuff that's been around for a long time, like peripheral vascular disease. They think that's done by uh, only done by vascular surgeons. And you can, you can, you find that you'll get other uh, referrals for other things when you're, you know, talking about PAE, but um, just be out there, be available, be ready to answer questions. Um, and for self-referral, it's a little more challenging. I think it's mainly uh, hospital specific. So at UC Health, we have a, a marketing department. So actually at CU also, so they help me reach out to, to physicians, but um, UC Health has a newsletter that um, one of my partners actually found out about and she does a lot of GAE. So she had published, um, it's Dr. Kazadaban, she came from UCLA. She published, there was an article published on her about GAE for patients with uh, osteoarthritis of the knees, which is a big, you know, big topic. It's a lot of incidents, uh, incidents in the population, especially here in Colorado, people are hiking, skiing. So she told me about that and I was able to, to do the same thing. And uh, public, uh, they, 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 this uh, one guy wrote an article about PAE, including me and one of the urologists I work with. And surprisingly, patients actually read those newsletters, especially the older patients, you know, they're very in tune with their health. Um, and I actually started reading that newsletter after, after I uh, <laughs> found out about it. It's, it actually has some good information in it. So I would look at, you know, you know, your marketing department, your hospital, talk to your urologist and talk to your primary care doctors. You want to get out in front of your primary care doctors and maybe create a little small uh, PowerPoint. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. That's great. Um, we do have a question um, from one of the attendees and the question is, uh, what is your endpoint for deciding to advance the microcatheter distally when you're doing the perfected technique? Oh, great. That's another great question. So that, that's just kind of difficult. Um, when I first started perfected technique, um, it was very difficult because I would just go to stasis of the intraprosthetic arteries, and then it would be much more difficult to advance the uh, microcatheter. But with more experience, I go to almost stasis. So, you know, we talk about this five to six beat stasis endpoint. So maybe you want to go to like seven to eight beat and then um, advance the catheter. So, you know, you want to end a little bit earlier than you would for a uterine fibroid embolization to be able to advance that catheter and have enough flow to get more embolic in there. But but it is challenging. That's that's a good question. It, it comes more with experience. Great. And we'll give it a little bit if anyone has any last minute questions. Sorry. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sachenko. Thank you, everyone who is able to join today. Um, hopefully, this was really helpful, and um, we'll encourage those of you who might not have known as much about PA before to kind of look into some of those papers and learn a little bit more about it. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, everyone.